Our guest on the pod today is Kenny Hayes. The Miami University alum's pro career actually began stateside with the main Red Claws before heading overseas. By now, he spent a decade overseas, beginning in Venezuela and including stops in Israel, Italy, Kazakhstan, Spain, France, and now several seasons in Turkey, where he joins us from today. But before we get to the interview with Kenny, just a reminder to help support the pod by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Those are some of the free, easy things to do to help us here at Expat Hoops. You can also find all our content on expathoops.com, as well as merchandise, so you can wear our logo with pride. And for our audio listeners, you can find us exclusive extra content on YouTube. But we have a lot to get into with Kenny, so let's welcome him to Expat Hoops. Welcome to the pod, Kenny. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate you, you know, reaching out, and and I'm sorry if I didn't re- hit you back right away, but uh, as soon as I saw it, you know, I hit you. I'm very bad at my <laughs> checking my messages and DMs, so don't take that personal at all. Well, this has been like sort of one of those periods where uh, if any of our uh, subscribers and listeners are aware, we're in a little bit of a content lull. That was not Kenny's fault. That was actually a lot going on with Tony and I behind the scenes as I recently moved. So uh, it all worked out for the best. And we're sitting down with you here today. And that's one of the things that uh, we've got a lot to get into with you. You've got a really interesting career um, as I said earlier on, you went to Miami University, the one in Ohio, not Florida. Uh, so as somebody who also went to school in a cold weather climate or moderate climate, uh, we both made a mistake in not going to Miami uh, in Florida, <laughs> but uh, it worked out pretty well for you. Um, you wound up going into the D League, uh, now the G League with the main red clause. Um, even though our focus is usually overseas hoops, it would be a mistake to kind of just go right past that. So uh, one of the things that we kind of ask our guests a lot is what was the transition like for uh, you for going from college to the professional game? And in your particular spot, like we usually like to ask the question of not, you know, did you want to go pro? Because that's usually uh, to play at a high level like you are doing. Usually everybody's goal is to do that. But at what point in your life uh, did you think that playing professionally was tangibly a thing that you could do? And it was like, okay, I need to talk with so-and-so. I need to talk with an agent. And this is how it's going to happen. What was that process like for you? Um, What's crazy is that I never really thought about playing pro. I just enjoy playing basketball. Uh, I, 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 I think it was my senior years when agents started, you know, contacting uh, my family and then trying to contact me and my coaches. And that's when it's like, oh, wow, I guess I can play pro. if Other people think I can play pro. So, yeah, of course, I'm going to try to take this serious. And um, from then I started, you know, trying to learn more about being a pro like because I didn't know anything I played high school basketball and I played college and then after that I'm like I don't know anything about playing professional basketball so um that's really how I started you know to flip my mindset as far as playing a prof- playing at do- playing basketball is my job you know was agents reaching out and at that point in time um what was your level of knowledge with playing overseas and saying, okay, if you don't necessarily make it in the NBA, uh, you know, that there are these other leagues and everything like that out there. I knew people that had played overseas. I had a family member um, that had played overseas and I just heard all these horror stories. (laughs) And I just was like, I don't know if I want to play over there on top of just being so far away from my family and friends it was just like I don't know if I truly want to play overseas maybe I just should stay here and figure out something else but um I had good people in my corner and I knew quite a few people that had played overseas and I heard good stories and I heard bad stories and I I was always you know um curious on what it was like living overseas and playing a different style of basketball. So that's what kind of motivated me to, you know, be open-minded to actually seeing what else is out there. 
So that's actually really interesting. You had some level of knowledge, whereas, you know, sometimes some people have almost none. Uh, and having heard some of the good, the bad, the ugly from overseas, uh, it is interesting to me, again, as we said in the intro, that you started stateside. Um, you joined the Boston Celtics, then D-League, G, uh, the, now the G-League affiliate, the main Red Claws. Um, you played two seasons there. Um, and your second season was wildly successful, but I'll let you kind of get into it a little bit. We talked about it off the pod as well, that, um, you know, what it was like at that point in time, the, the D league now G league has come a long way. Hopefully it continues to get better with its pay and things like that. But back in the 2010 to 2012 period that you were playing for them, what was your experience like? not only off the court, but then also on the court. I think you kind of laid it out to me uh, very interestingly that, you know, the first season was, it was okay. Uh, but then the second season was really kind of uh, pivotal for you. So I'll let you take that, um, you know, in terms of what was off the court, but also on the court, what was going on during that two year period in your career. I will say uh, I got drafted by the Red Claws and I'm not going to lie. I was extremely nervous when I went to the training camp because here, this kid coming from a mid-major Miami of Ohio, and then the guys that I was going to have to go up against were guys that went to big schools and guys that I've seen on TV. And I'm like, oh man, that dude is good. Man, I'm going to have to try. I have to, I have to beat this guy out. And what was crazy to me was when I got there, and I the first couple pra practices, I realized they weren't better than me. It was it was just like shocking to me because I'm like wow they play at you know this big school and I expected them to be you know so much better than me but I remember telling my dad I'm like they're not better than me um and that's what really got me going you know because I'm like okay maybe they can they have the political side on their side you know but I have the game and I think that if I continue to work hard and I just you know have this mentality that you know I'm 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 supposed to be here uh it'll take me a long way and like I say my first year it, it was it was new to me just being a pro in general I'm used to doing you know in college you do everything together as a as a unit you wear the same thing you you uh you can't leave the hotel and stuff like that where <laughs> i remember my first couple uh road trips or my first road trip guys were just doing whatever i'm like hey what time is meal and they're like meal get your own food <laughs> like no team meal like you get your own food if you're hungry go get some food <laughs> so that was like you know that part was really different um and it was really, you know, you're you're a grown man now, you know, like this is this is your job. So uh, it's your responsibility to make sure you show up on time for your job and, you know, you be ready to perform when your number when your name is called outside of the other things off the court. They don't have anything to do with that. Um, they they are more focused on the basketball. Of course, you can't, you know, be getting in trouble and, and, and doing drugs and stuff like that. But as far as like, you know, they treat you like a grown man. And that was something new to me, especially coming from college. Like I say, everything's so structured and everything. So, you know, in order, it was that was so new to me. Um, so the basketball part was something that was you know i i had to get used to because when i was there i think avery bradley got sent down to our team avery bradley and Sh uh, sharon collins and you know anytime a player gets sent down from an nba team they automatically play like it doesn't matter you could be better than them they're playing regardless because that's what they're being sent down for to play and get better so it was it was kind of it was tough for me because anytime guys would come down, I was the probably the second guard behind Jamar Smith. I backed Jamar up, so 
anytime guards got sent down, I was out of luck. Like I never, I wouldn't play. So it was something that was frustrating because I just wanted to always play, but I had to understand like it wasn't my time. And the only thing that I could do is control what I could control and just try to get, continue to get better. And I looked at it as a blessing to play against guys that were in the NBA and being sent down because I looked at it like, okay, well, I can get better playing against this guy because, you know, he's in the NBA and that's where I want to be at. So I never took anything personal. I just took it as like learning. Um, and that's really what I did that first year in the G League or D League then. But We're both going to interchangeably screw this up, but we're talking, anybody <laughs> listening, if we say G or D, it's the same league. Uh, it's just <laughs> what it's called now. So we're invariably, this is not going to be the first time we're going to screw it up. It's probably going to be like the third, the fourth, the fifth. So uh, <laughs> we, we're definitely talking about the same thing. So off the pod, we were talking a little bit Um you know, about how this going into the second season was very pivotal for you. Uh, if you could uh, recount kind of the conversations that were happening towards the end of your first season and kind of how that laid the groundwork for your second season, where again, uh, you were going to become the D league's most improved player, the entire league in 2012. So obviously the end of year one heading into year two is super pivotal for you. Yeah, man, that summer I was so dedicated and, in the gym, I, I wanted. I, I knew I needed to get stronger, and I just needed to get better at certain aspects of my game. And I focused on that extremely heavy. Um, and I was just very confident coming into that second year. I knew the management. We had a new coach. Uh, my first coach was Danny Ainge's son, Austin Ainge, and he took a position with the Celtics. And that second year, we brought in Dave Lato. And he was a guy that, you know, took me under his wing. And I still talk to him to this day. Um, he got the best out of me. He knew how to push me. He knew what to say to me. And, you know, I looked at it like, okay, I worked my butt off this offseason. And I'm here to prove a point that I belong. And I want a shot at the NBA. And uh, that was the year of the lockout, I believe. And I started the year off in the in the in the D League very, very well. And the NBA started back up, the training camps, and Cleveland Cavaliers had invited me uh to the training camp. And that was a uh, it was I was excited, but I was also like, okay, this is just like uh the beginning, right? I got what I wanted. So now you know you need to prove that you belong there. And I enjoyed it the most because I was able to play against a guy who was the number one pick in the NBA draft every day. And that's Kyrie Irving. And I remember <laughs> my s first day, my first day, my dad was like, how was it? And I was like, uh, he is the best basketball player I've ever played against. <laughs> and he was like maybe 18 at this time. And I had played against, I think, Derrick Rose before that, uh, Westbrook, uh, who else? Darren Collis. And I played against some really good guards, but it just didn't come close to Kyrie Irving. I just was like, his, uh, his skill set is unbelievable. Like, I've never seen a guy that can shoot, can dribble, uh, can finish with either hand at the rim and very just crafty. And I was just like, it, I've just never seen it before. And that was, you know, something that, you know, I embraced because I'm like, wow, he's 18. I think at the time I was 23, 24 maybe. And I'm like, he's 18 and he's like way better than me. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like, okay, now I need to definitely get better. Um, and so, long story short, didn't end up making the team. I made it to the last cut. Uh, it was between me and Michael Thompson, Clay Thompson's brother. Uh, they wanted to go with a bigger guard shooter. Um, so I ended up going back to Maine. And I was just so – my confidence was to the roof. Like, I just knew that I was – 
supposed I belong in the NBA. That's just how I felt in my head. Uh, and I just played with a chip on my shoulder for the rest of the year. And, you know, I had a crazy night one night where we're playing – Springfield Armor, I think that was the name. They were number one in the league. Uh, they had us down 20 at halftime. And I just, I don't know what got into me. I, you know, I had, I think I had 20 points at halftime, but I, I think in the third or fourth quarter, I had 17 consecutive baskets. Um, and I ended up ending the game with 52 points. <laughs> and, it was one of those things, like, even afterwards, I still couldn't believe I did that. I was like, wow, like, I don't even know what got into my body. I was like, I just don't even remember it. I still don't remember. I just, when I watch it, it's like, I I, 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 I remember it, but I don't. And from that point, my career kind of just did a, this, this was a turning point. Um, I got on the radar. I was a top five NBA Call up guy in the in the D League, and I had overseas teams calling asking my agent about me, and that's when things started to like go uphill for me, and I, you know, I just took advantage of it. Thanks to SeatGeek for sponsoring Expat Hoops. We recently became a brand ambassador for them. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets. They offer a 0 to 10 score on each ticket to know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green means good, red means bad. You get the idea. It's a really easy way to get tickets to events. Plus, our viewers get $20 off their first ticket purchase with the Expat Hoops code. Click the link in the description to download the app. Remember the code Expat Hoops, E X P A T H O O P S, all one word, to save yourself $20 off your first ticket purchase with SeatGeek. In our house, when we use a VPN, we are sure to use NordVPN. NordVPN secures up to six devices and is compatible with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even your Wi-Fi router. Plus, it's no risk to your wallet. Head over to their website for pricing or contact customer support 24-7. And remember, your purchase is always safe with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description to use our code and make sure you're secure with NordVPN. So it's actually interesting you talked about the 52 point. There's a documentary that uh, we'll link to it um, for the YouTube subscribers uh, that you can see a little portion of it. Um, it's about an 11 minute documentary, which is also worth checking out about you. Uh, but one of the things that we talked about off the pod as well was um, your first overseas job was going to become Venezuela. And the link back here to the D-League is how much money were you making in the D-League at that point in time? Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were talking about it off the pod, like this is a point in time where uh, your oldest daughter was um, super young at that point in time. You're you're playing basketball and you're doing well, but you kind of need more money. So this is how it links up to Venezuela. So take us through how much you were making in the D-League at that point in time and how you actually begin down the path to overseas basketball. Well, I think I, I was either on the B or A or B contract. Um, and my first year in the D League, I was on the C contract, which was 13000 So my second year, I think they put me on either a B or A contract. And I think maybe 16000 I made for the, for the whole season. And it just wasn't enough. Like, the season ended, and I was still trying to figure out, okay, do I need to get a job? Like, you know, because I still got to provide. And, you know, I had a, I had a daughter. Um, and then this random agent, you know, had contacted me from Venezuela. And I had told my American agent about it. And he was like, well, I don't know if we should do it. But at that time, like I said, I needed money. So I ended up going to Venezuela for, like I said, three three weeks I believe and I think in those three weeks I made the same amount of money that I made for the entire year in the D-League so that right there was when I realized okay maybe I should think about going overseas because at that point before that I was so caught up in getting the NBA call up um I didn't even think about overseas it's like okay should I come back a third season and hopefully this year will be the year I get a call up. But then I, you know, I, I had to like 
stop just thinking about myself and I had to think about my daughter and I had to provide for her. And it was one of them things where my agent came with a a nice deal uh, in Israel and it was like a no brainer that I, you know, I had to take it. And, and, and it was tough because you had people in your ear like, oh man, I think you should give it one more chance. Just don't chase the money. But then I'm like, you know, anything can happen. You can get injured. Uh, you can, anything can happen. And it's like, boom, then what? So I had to take advantage of like, you know, blessings that were coming my way after all. And exactly too, especially when you're talking about the NBA, uh, going back even all the way to our first guest, Tony Skin, uh, he was somebody that had some interest uh, from the NBA. But the thing is, the decision, especially with young kids at that point in time uh, that you have to support, uh, you know, are you willing to be the 15th or, or person on the roster and something happens in your, you know, cut or something, whereas sometimes overseas is the more, I guess, secure route. Uh, and so at that yeah. point in time with Israel on the horizon, um, you would spend the next two seasons in Israel, two different clubs. What was your experience like? Because as you said, in Venezuela, you didn't really uh, play that many games, but, um, and you kind of hinted at this in the, in the intro as well, that um, getting to play different styles of basketball. Uh, Israel is one of those places that has a different style of basketball. Take us through your first two seasons in Israel, not only on the floor, but off the floor as well. Man, I remember, and this is the time where, like, I don't think that my iPhone worked without Wi-Fi overseas. So I had never been overseas. I had never been on a flight no longer than four hours, I would say. So... I remember when I first landed in Israel, I couldn't contact my family. Uh, I didn't even know who I was going to be meeting once I got through um, Border Patrol. And I just remember some a guy had a sign up with my name on it. And I'm just, you know, you, you hear, you watch movies and stuff. And it's like, man, do I go with this person though? Because I don't. You know, I haven't, I don't know who this person is. He just got my name on a sign. So long story short, man, it was, we had like an hour and a half, two hour trip to get to Galil. That's where I was. Galil was probably about an hour and a half from Tel Aviv. And then I think we were in traffic, which made it even longer. So I remember once I got to Galil, all I see is like hills and just nothing, nothing there, just hills and I'm just like scared, really. And I, the first thing I said, "Hey, man, can I, can you, can I get the Wi-Fi password?" Because I needed to contact my family and let them know that I made it safe. Um, and as soon as my phone got on Wi-Fi, I had all these texts and missed calls coming through. And it was just, it was, it was different. I was super homesick for. I would say the first month for sure, I was super homesick. Um, and that changed once, you know, practice in the season started, it started to change for me. Um, but I, it, it was, the style of play was also different. You know, like I said, the D league is more open court running gun where overseas it's more, I would say more structured and, and, and you can't really attack the basket like you would want because they don't have a three second defensive rule over there. So it was a lot of things that I had to learn and I didn't really know how to play the pick and roll. Uh, I was used to just playing the pick and roll looking for my shot and overseas. No, they want, you know, play the pick and roll, look for the roll guy, look for the weak side, get the ball movement. Um, kind of like, you know, Golden State Warriors, San Antonio type of style basketball, something I wasn't used to. And, you know, I would say my first year was kind of like a it was a learning curve. You know, I, 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 I enjoyed it, though. I never pouted. I never pointed fingers or anything like that. I knew that I had to get better. Like, I told myself I couldn't wait to the offseason because I told myself I'm going to watch a lot of film and I'm going to learn how the overseas game is played. And that's really what I did. And I came back my second year overseas in Israel with a different team. And that's really when my career kind of took off. 
We have merch. Head over to the Expat Hoop Store where you'll find t-shirts, hoodies, masks, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and more. It's one of many ways you can show support for the podcast, so head over there and pick up some merch. That link below is in the video description, or you can head over to our website, expathoops.com, and click merch. We offer a couple of different Expat Hoops logos, and we have men's, women's, and kids' sizes, so you can get something for everyone. One of the other things is we talked a little bit off the pod at another point uh, where your career kind of takes off. There's like all these, and this is common with the overseas game too, is like there's all these different spots in somebody's career that you can point to that are are, are a pivotal point. Um, you've gone through a couple of them now. Uh, the next few seasons you would play in Italy, Kazakhstan, and Spain before we get to kind of what would become largely your home base overseas in Turkey. Uh, and we were talking off the pod, uh, Kazakhstan going into Spain is a is another pivotal point in your career. Take us through what it was like playing at Astana and uh, what it was like as you got there versus when you were leaving and how that led uh, to your next spot in Spain. Uh, well, Kazakhstan was very interesting because it was <clears> – <throat> I got the contract like last minute, and they had already had majority of their guys that were there – uh, the year before, so I was this newcomer guy coming in, and I can remember when I first arrived there, it was so cold. It was extremely cold, and I'm just like, yo, what the heck, man? Like, I'm, I'm not used to this, Um, and that was, that was, living-wise, that was tough. It was, it, it, it was tough, Uh, and I could tell when I first got there, the coach didn't really respect me because I was really a nobody. Uh, you had Jerry Johnson, who was a really good guard. Um, he had a past Kazakhstan passport. Nick Kenner-Melly, who just got, you know, MVP at ACB. Uh, and then you had Pat Kalathis, who uh, had won a championship in, in Israel. And then he went there and he had been playing there for, I think, two seasons, um, two or three seasons before I got there. So, um, they were all comfortable, and here I am, this new kid coming in who's just trying to find my way. And, you know, it was one of them things where I was struggling in the preseason. I could tell the coach really didn't trust me until he had to. Uh, Jerry Johnson ended up getting hurt. I think he was out for maybe two months. And that's really when things went good for me. Not, I mean, I I, I wasn't happy that Jerry got hurt at all because I – he was like my, like my OG, the guy who uh, I would talk to, and he'd give me advice, and I always listened to him. Um, but I took advantage of the opportunity, and I can remember my first game. I think I my first game when Jerry was out, I had thirty, and then the next game I had thirty. I had back to back thirties, and I can remember, you know. Uh, my coach's energy towards me was just a little different. <laughs> it was a little, he was a little bit nicer. You could tell in situations he wanted me to have the ball. He's like, look for Kenny, get Kenny the ball. And, uh, and it, it, it boosts my, you know, my confidence just to know that, okay, now the coach is starting to believe in me a little bit. Um, and from there, even when Jerry came back, um, I think they the the guys respected me then because it's like yo this this kid can play. Um, I was the second lead scorer in the league behind Keith Langford, who was like I say he's one of the best American overseas scorers to ever play overseas in my opinion. Uh, he's just uh, he's so lethal on the court; he can do everything. So me, you know, challenging him is like the scoring leader in the, in the league. And I was also top, I think five in assists. I was shooting 50, 40, 90. Uh, it was like, okay, who is this kid? And then I started getting, you know, agents wanting to sign me. Uh, long story short, I end up signing with VO basket, uh, Mishko, uh, who is one of the biggest agencies in Europe. You know, it, it, it's the best agency in Europe. Um, and I signed with him, and I'll say, like, less than a month later, I signed in with a EuroLeague team in Spain, Unicaja, um, in Malaga. So 
Uh, and that was a fun experience as well. And actually take us through that. You were kind of talking off the pot a little bit about that in terms of uh, even some of the practices when you joined up in Spain and EuroLeague. Take us through what that was like uh, when you did uh, sign on with them. Uh, I was nervous. I remember the first day I landed there, I didn't think I was going to practice, and they threw me into practice. They taught me the plays, and they, you know, they had me come in early, taught me the plays, had me run the plays with a bunch of young guys. And they expected me to remember them. And the good thing, I remembered them because I, I I knew what they were doing. I could tell that they were trying to see if I would, if I was focused and if I was ready. So I remember, you know, uh, they gave me like a playbook and I had to, <laughs> I remember I went home and I'm just like studying it like it's a, like it's, a test that I have in school and I came back that, that practice. And I think they were kind of like, kind of surprised that I remembered the plays. Um, and I was nervous because I, you know, I'm playing against these guys who are the year on the Euro league. They're good. They're the best of the best. And I held my own and it was the practices I think were to me were the best part of my experience there because I was playing against some really good dudes every day and we were battling and we were going at it and we were friends off the court, but when it was time for practice, man, we were all just at each other. And that's what I enjoyed the most. And uh, I think that that's another thing that helped with my confidence and, and, and just made me want to just keep getting better, especially in the off season. And so this is about 2016, and this is getting to another pivotal point in your career because as we sit here in 2022, um, you have spent quite a bit of time in Turkey uh, from this period of time. There's been a couple seasons here and there in France and Italy, but for the most part, the last six years, six seasons rather, or uh, I guess we're getting on, yeah, six years, six or so years, you've spent in Turkey. Um, take us through what it was like getting to Turkey and kind of like what has, has been uh, where we are today, where you've kind of got this second home overseas in Turkey and what that's like for you and, and why you're so comfortable there, because uh, you know, not only a long period of time spent there, but you've been uh, an all-star there a couple of times uh, you were the leading scorer in 2019. So what is it about uh, Turkey that is kind of home base, home away for home for you? Man, I remember I was very nervous about coming to Turkey because uh, it's, you know, you hear things in the news back home. So you just automatically assume like, oh, man, it's wild over there. It's crazy. And I can remember my first night in Turkey when I when I finally got here, they played a prayer loud uh, and everyone hears it. Um, it goes off, I think, maybe – Three now I don't even pay it any because I'm so used to it. But I remember I'm like, what is going on? Like, what what's that noise? Like, and they're like, that's just a prayer. And I'm like, what? Why are they playing it? Is everything okay? And um, I remember it woke me up at like five in the morning, and I'm just like bugging out, like, what is going on? <laughs> and that was something that I had to get used to. And I was also nervous coming to Turkey because I heard all these good things about the league that, you know, they say it's arguably one of the toughest leagues, the Spanish league or the Turkish league is the toughest leagues in Europe. So me, I was nervous because I'm like, man, I hope that I'm, you know, I'm good enough, you know, to, to, to play in this league. And I would say the preseason games, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm good enough to play in this league. And from there, I just like the pressure. You know, I like the pressure because they, like I said, these, these teams were over here that pay you this money uh, and they expect you to uh, play at a high level. And if you don't, they get rid of you quick. And I kind of caught on early. And it was one of them things that out of all the leagues that I've played in, I enjoyed this league the most because it just fit my style of play. Um, 
And it was one of them situations where it just felt like it was it was it was just for me. Like I don't know how to explain it. I think every player, especially vets, have that one country that they just enjoy the most and they, they feel most comfortable in. And I would definitely say Turkey is my second home. <laughs> And one of the things that we were talking off the pod that was kind of interesting to me was uh, as you're talking to either, let's say your younger self or even somebody that's coming up now, um, one of the things I think you started alluding to was that, you know, there are other good leagues across across the world that you could go play into. You could definitely chase, you know, high level leagues, more money and things like that. But one of the interesting things I thought in talking to you off the pod was, especially as it relates to Turkey for you, almost kind of find a place that you're comfortable with and stick around. Um, So if you could kind of expand on that a little bit. And so either as you're talking to your younger self, or if there's somebody that's considering playing professional basketball overseas, what would your advice to them be in regards to your personal experience here with Turkey? I would say, because I played in Turkey, then I left and then I came back. I would say that, uh, if someone don't always just chase the money, you know, I, of course, you, you know, everybody wants to get paid and, and, and make as much money as they can. But I, I think that, um, if you think long-term, you're better off maybe taking a little bit less in a country that you're most comfortable in and you got more respect in than going to a country that doesn't really know you and you have to gain their respect and not saying that you can't, but, uh, you know, sometimes you go for the money and they expect, you know, Hey, I'm paying you this money. So, you know, you need to do this or do that. Whereas if you say you don't play well in Turkey, right. I don't play well in Turkey. The coaches have way more respect for me and understand like, yeah, he don't worry. He He's going to be fine. I'll, you know, I've seen this because when I went to France, I, I remember <laughs> first preseason game, I had three points and it's preseason game. At this point in my career, I just don't like preseason games. It's just like, okay, it's just, I do it just to keep my cardio and keep my body moving. But it was one of them things where I remember I didn't play good and I got a call from my agent like, Hey, yeah, the team is worried. You know, they're not, you know, you only had three points. <clears throat> and I'm like, are you serious? I'm just like, what are you talking about? It's preseason. I'm not worried about three points. And I had three points in a preseason game. I'm just trying to get through the preseason so the season can start. And so, you know, back to your question, I would definitely just say, um, find a place that, you know, you love the most. And just maximize your time, man, because I'm in Turkey now. I'm 35, going on 36. I still get respect here. And everyone, you know, uh, uh, I feel here loves my game more than other countries. And it's like, I think I could play here until I'm pretty much 40. And that's what it's about. And and if you love basketball, you want to continue to play for a long time. That's what I feel like. That's what I think it's about. Well, one of the things I can echo that is, uh, you know, going through your Instagram replies, it is it is amazing to me to see, especially from a lot of the turkey years, you do have in your mentions people that are like, oh, come to Galatasaray, come to Fenerbahce <laughs> and everything. So, again, that that's not just you saying that you have a level of respect. I mean, you can literally independently verify this. Uh, and a lot of the comments of your posts are people that are like, come to our team and they're, they're Turkish league teams. So yeah. uh, certainly speaks to the fact that you've been there for a while uh, doing really well. Like I said, you've got accolades that you're multiple time all-star you led the league. Um, so that's probably a good place for us to end at least the regular pod. Um, I definitely have some extras for you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us during the regular portion of the pod. You got some time for some expat extras for us. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. Like I said, um, it's always, uh, it's always, to me, I think it's great 
to listen to people's, you know, stories, because we talked about this. Everybody's story is unique and everybody's special in their own way. And I think that it's great for other people to hear that because it's inspirational and it inspires people to potentially want to do what, we, what, what we're doing. So, um, like I said, I thank you for reaching out and wanting me to come on. Well, I'm not sure there's a better way to sum it up. So I'm just going to basically be quiet at this point and say, check out the expat extras. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.